Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's the weekend edition of the Cabral Concept. Thanks so much for tuning in here, especially if you're listening same day when this goes live on Saturday. I'll be answering our community's questions today. Every Saturday and Sunday, I do this. I love being able to answer about a half a dozen questions each day. Uh, a dozen questions for the weekend for those people that love math. And, um, you know, it's always it's always interesting to see kind of what's going on with the community. But I'll tell you this, after having done this now for, well, about 22 years or so, uh, a little bit longer if you count part-time, that I'll tell you what, that the more things change, the more they stay the same, as I like to say, right? I didn't make that up, of course. But all we have are really new names for different diseases of the body, right? And yes, we have new viruses, we have new this, we have new that, but nothing radically different than really what we've been dealing with. The problem is people are just more and more sick. They're more and more toxic. They're more and more medicated than, than they ever have been. And so my job, especially on these weekend host calls, is to simply try to share with you that there is an underlying root cause for everything that it literally is the proverbial rain barrel overflowing that enables our bodies to show these signs of dis-ease. So what I want to do is I always want to take it back to the beginning. How can we figure out the underlying root causes? Because if we can do that, we can rebalance the body to then achieve a state of health. And in this state of health, dis-ease of the body cannot live. So that is what we're going to go over on this show and every show of the Cabral Concept. Just please do understand, I have to give you this disclaimer, and that is that we are not providing any medical advice, any diagnosis, any treatment, uh, or cure for any dis-ease of the body. But you also know my underlying philosophy, so you know why I wouldn't do that anyway. All right, let's get started with the show. First question is from Nicole. Nicole says, hi, Dr. Cabral. I have an aura ring and I get quite a lot of deep sleep for above the average. Most nights I get over three hours of deep and it averages about 40% plus of my sleep. I get normal amounts of REM, but I was curious why I would get so much deep sleep. I'm active and go to sleep around 9.30 most nights. Is there any negative reasons as to why my body would sleep so much or get so much deep sleep? Is uh, more of it a good thing? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, again, appreciate you tuning in. I've got lots of shows on how to increase your deep sleep and REM sleep. I get so many people asking me this question. You're already doing great, Nicole, which is amazing. That means your body's able to recover overnight. So I have not seen any detrimental effects of deep sleep. However, there are detrimental effects of REM sleep. Deep sleep typically happens earlier in the night from about 10 a.m., uh, sorry, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., which is why I tell people try to get to bed a little bit earlier. Now, of course, you can still get deep sleep even if you go to bed at midnight or 2 a.m. I'm not saying that, but it works much better as your cortisol is dipping or at its lowest point right around 9.30 uh, p.m. at night. Now, uh, a quick aside, you don't have this issue, uh, but some people get too much REM sleep. More than really two, two and a half hours of REM sleep, not more than two, more than two and a half, three hours of REM sleep can signal that there may be an issue with depression or emotional issues or just overall life stress because the amygdala, uh, the part of the brain that's kind of signaling or responding or thinking about all this different stress may be signaling to the body that you need need to get more REM sleep in order to be able to lower stress hormones and recover. It's only one reason, but certainly we've seen that um, more and more REM is not necessarily a good thing. With deep, I have not seen a lot of negatives around deep sleep. If anybody knows of any, do leave them in the comments. I would love to see that research as well. So the good news is your deep sleep seems to be totally fine. Why might you be getting more of it? Because you're getting to bed potentially, you're getting to bed earlier, and your body's dropping cortisol levels right away. You're producing more melatonin. You might have a good amount of serotonin being produced earlier in the night as well. It'd be interesting, Nicole, if you ever go to bed, don't do this on purpose, but if you ever go to bed at 11 p.m., uh, do you get less deep sleep that night? If so, you may have your answer that your body is very in tune with going to bed at 9.30 p.m., getting you right into that deep sleep and helping your body to recover. All right, Alicia's up next. Dr. Peral, I love your podcast and your wisdom. My question is about sauna. Well, thank you, Alicia. Uh, if you could have a sauna in your house, 
would you choose infrared sauna or dry sauna? I'm asking because I just bought a house and I will make some changes to it. I added, I want to add a sauna and I'm not sure if infrared sauna would be better than regular dry sauna. Thanks in advance for your answer. All right, I've actually answered this before, but I'm absolutely happy to answer it again for you. And the answer is I love both because they both have unique advantages. A regular dry sauna, like a finished sauna, which I do have, it's outside though, it's called a barrel sauna, it can get up to 200 degrees. Not saying you want to get into a 200 degree sauna, but maybe you do. And you're able to do that with a nice dry sauna. So you can get that like 19 minute benefit that I've talked about before. If nobody knows what I'm talking about here, please do listen to the podcast called 19 Minutes of This. Basically, just check it out at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Uh, you probably even Google that as well because it's been listened to uh, many, many times where I, where I gave the original research many years ago. So that you can do a sauna. Like, here's the thing. Okay. If you want to do your saunas in 20 minutes or less, but you want to do them frequently, 25 minutes or less, you want to do a dry sauna. Okay. I'm going to give you a caveat in just a moment, which is what I do. Um, but if you don't mind doing a 30, 40 minute or more sauna at a little lower temperature, because you don't do so well at high heat, then an infrared sauna is great. An infrared sauna though, will give you more of the detox space functions at the lower temperature. It has been clinically shown to help with heavy metal detox and believe it or not, even mold. So I love both. Um, if I could give you a suggestion, it would be this. Buy a dry sauna, buy a finished sauna, and then you can bring in infrared lights if you want to the um, dry sauna, okay? Is it maybe as good as a, you know, pure um, infrared sauna? No, and a pure infrared sauna that has inf that has far, mid, and near, you know, is absolutely fantastic. Or if you just want to do far or near, that, that that's okay. But those are amazing as well. They do different things. And if you're really focused on detox, you know, if you really want that for heavy metals and mold, get yourself a good infrared sauna. If you want to do shorter saunas, like I like to do, and you want to uh, get the heat shock proteins really working, then you want that dry sauna that goes high temperature. Now, again, I can just bring in infrared light to my dry sauna and I get the best of, again, like I said, both worlds. So hopefully that's helpful. Tina's up next. It's 4 a.m. and I'm wide awake. I went to bed around 9.30 p.m. And between then and now, I'm literally, I literally woke up eight different times. I'm 53, did the big five plus the gut and parasite. My hormones are low. I did the 14-day detox, gallbladder flush, currently five weeks into the CBO, six weeks into the protocol that my IHP level two gave me to follow. I'm doing the adrenal soothe, adrenal energy, DHEA, the deep sleep protocol, magnesium. I'm following my protocols and I'm having no or little to no relief. I did two different parasite cleanses. I did the mold test and I have no mold in my body. I don't know what's going on with me. I just need to sleep. I'm unplugging two hours before sleep. I'm doing sleep Deep breathing, meditation, I do the theta healing, calming my sympathetic nervous system. My cortisol is high right before I go to sleep. I knew that was going to be <laughs> what the answer. Um, and in the morning, it's very low. I knew that was going to be the answer. I'm lost at this point and don't know what to do. Of course, I will keep doing my protocols. And after 12 weeks, I'm supposed to test my hormones again to see where my levels are. I just don't understand why I wake up at least 10 times per night. Okay. So we got it. Totally understand. This is, I always say, this is not normal, but it's very common, right? I see, well, I mean, I've seen this all the time in my practice. I used to be this person, right? Right? So I totally get it. Um, all right, here's what you need to look at. Your hormones aren't balanced. That's the main thing. So yes, gut function matters. Yes, liver function matters. All that matters, but we need to balance your hormones. Bottom line, that's the bottom line. Okay, so we need to make sure you get enough B vitamins so you produce enough serotonin so you produce enough melatonin. So that's a, that's very, very important, all right? You need to make sure you're enough, getting enough B vitamins. I'm sure you're probably doing the daily nutritional support. I'm sure you're probably doing like an activated B complex at lunch, maybe even on a dinner, okay? Good. Again, I can't give you exact advice because I don't have any of your labs, but I, I get it. You most likely want to be using using that adrenal soothe at lunch and the adrenal soothe at dinner and the magnesium at dinner and potentially before bed. 
DHEA seems like a good idea because if you're low in estrogen, well, you're not going to be able to sleep either. That's really important. But we also want to make sure you're high enough in progesterone as well. My recommendation is it sounds like you're on a great protocol. It's just these things aren't able to be necessarily fixed in four to six weeks. So we need to keep working with it. But we need to relax that sympathetic nervous system. We need to relax that cortisol before bed because if not, well, we're not going to be able to get the proper hormones that we need in order to be able to literally unplug the body and rest and relax. So you're on the right path. You're doing your breath work. Um, definitely, you should be working with someone to just release any trauma if there's any there, any emotional-based stress. You need to get that out of the body or your body can't literally unwind and get into the parasympathetic nervous system. The good news is this, Tina, we know what most likely is, right? There's definitely this low hormone issue with potentially progesterone and estrogen. Uh, we see this all the time. Again, I don't know if you are in uh, premenopause, perimenopause, menopause. I have no idea. Uh, but we, we do see this all the time. There's a sleep-based issue. We need to make sure we're balancing that. So 12 to 16 weeks on this protocol. Stay on the supplements. Retest. Where are you on the supplements? How are you doing? Do we need to increase some of them? decrease some of them. And then eventually in time, you're going to be able to wean off many of them as the lifestyle and the relaxation of the nervous system takes hold. All right. You're on the right track, Tina. I know it's frustrating. Believe me, I've been there. Make sure you're using that sleep help protocol as well. All right. Amy's up next. After having the virus for eight months uh, or eight months ago, sorry, let me just write down. I, I always like to censor myself as well so the podcast doesn't get censored. Uh, I noticed my underarm odor got very strong oniony smell. Previously, I had very light to no body odor. I haven't changed anything in my diet. I don't eat a lot of onions or garlic or supplements. What could be causing this? I'm a healthy 38-year-old female. Thanks. Okay, this was written on March 19th. Just so everybody knows, uh, we're about 8 to uh, eight to 10 weeks behind. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Eight to 10 weeks. So, um, oh, I can give you the answer. So believe it or not, I know that this is pretty wild, but they actually have dogs that are able to now detect cancer, certain viruses, etc. in humans. And the reason is that their body odor actually changes, right? It smells a certain way, but and I, I know it's wild, but your body odor changes based on your overall health. Now, it doesn't mean you're not healthy, but what we do know about this particular virus is the inflammation seems to hang around for a little bit. That's what some people, and more than others, right? That's, again, the rain barrel effect. How healthy were you coming in? How strong was the viral load? That's the rain barrel effect. Again, uh, if you haven't read the rain barrel effect, that's my book. I wrote it a few years back. It's free. I pay for to print the book. It costs about $8 to print it. That's the truth. It costs... A little over $10 to ship it. We charge $7.95. That's it. We want to get that book to as many people as possible. So for $7.95, we print the book. We pay for the extra shipping. We want people to read it. Like Tell your friends. Tell your family. <clears throat> the goal is not to make any money off the book. Uh, any money I do make from Amazon sales, I donate 100% of it to charity. The goal is to get it out because the rain barrel effect explains all of this. Um, it's also why, again, people who are not as healthy or more toxic typically have a stronger body odor. I believe that, Amy, we just need to make sure you're doing the right things. I personally, if I were you, I'd be using something like our daily foundational protocol and the immunity protocol, maybe only for 12 weeks you decide to use it, fine. But remember, your body gets depleted when, it's, when it has to overcome a particular virus or health-based condition. So hopefully that was helpful, Amy. But yes, your body odor can change. And by the way, body odor can change based on sulfur-based foods, medications you're on, um, yes, uh, immune system changes, uh, and supplements, and, and much more. So there we go. Joe is next up, and Joe says, Hello, Dr. Ball. My 12-year-old daughter recently had blood tests done and showed her DHEA elevated. It was 200 above their normal range, and her prolactin was 2 above average range. She also has a noticeable mustache and hair on the upper lip and lower parts of her back. Thin but noticeable. She started her cycle at 9 and still has irregular cycles. Curious as to what you would recommend for this. Cannot get into an endocrinologist until July. Thank you. Okay. Well, so there's good news. The good news is I would absolutely work with an integrative health practitioner level two or someone on the Equal Life team. And the bottom line is you're going to go to an endocrinologist. Really, what are they going to tell you? Like, honestly, like I'm not, I'm not trying to put uh, conventional medicine down. I'm not. 
But what are they going to do? They're going to put your daughter on birth control, right? Or they're going to just give her a medication. Like, that's the truth. Or they're going to be like, hey, nothing we can do, but if it seems to get worse, well, you know, do something then. I mean, uh, uh, your daughter either has elevated levels of testosterone, elevated levels of estrogen, lower levels of progesterone. Like, again, I'm not a betting person at all, but if I had to bet, I'd bet testosterone's on the higher side, estrogen's on the higher side, progesterone's on the lower side, and all of this is correctable. It's correctable through nutrition, it's correctable through stress, it's correctable through uh, nutritional supplements, it's correctable through exercise, like it's all correctable. And so I just don't want to see your daughter who's 12 years old end up with PCOS, dysregulated blood sugar, testosterone, estrogen dominance, low thyroid, etc. So that's what I recommend. You don't have to work with us. Again, like I am a messenger for health. That's all I want to be as a teacher. That's it. I just want to be a teacher of health. Please go find a great naturopathic doctor locally where you live. Work virtually with an integrative health practitioner level two. You can go to ihp.coach. That's it. Just ihp.coach or the longer name for the website is integrativehealthpractitioner.org. Choose a, a practitioner that fits you. Like nothing wrong with it all at all. That's fantastic. You don't have to work with us at Equal Life. If you want to, you can. Like that's the thing is like I'm not here to sell anybody on anything, but I can tell you for sure that there is a hormonal imbalance most likely. Uh, 200 above normal range for a 12-year-old female who's moving into peak uh, puberty is not all that wild. It's really not because again, we're not talking about DHEA like on the functional medicine range, which is from like a healthy six to maybe like a 20, but we're talking about hundreds on a blood work exam. So it's, it's just it's just different, right? We would run a saliva and a blood drop test. The lab that you want to run is called the Stress Hormones, Mood, and Metabolism. Uh, the short link is stephencabral.com forward slash hormones dash test. That will take you there. And again, you can run it with anybody. All right. Thanks, Joe, for writing in. Always happy to help. So feel free to do a follow-up if you'd like as well. Brianna is up next and last. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I searched the podcast archive for fecal, fecal microbiota transplantation, FMT, and found no results on the topic. Very interested to hear your thoughts and opinion on the procedure, specifically in regards to how it may or may not Benefit individuals with the autism spectrum disorder. Thank you. All right. So, Brianna, definitely have talked about this before. However, um, I probably just would have written fecal transplant because that's what it's been known for the last 15 years since people have been doing it. But, again, in conventional medicine, they always like to give it a more fancy name um, to just make themselves sound really, really fancy. So that's what we do in the medical-based field is uh, we make ourselves sound really fancy. So, but all it is is a stool transplant, fecal transplant. That's really what you're doing. You just have to find a healthy individual, right? That's a big part of it. And then they are literally going to almost like give you an enema with that. You in my opinion, you never want to swallow the capsules. They do that for pets. Not my opinion of a healthy thing to do because you're giving colon bacteria through the mouth, which has to travel through the small intestine. Not a big fan of that. So let's just see at stephencabral.com forward slash pod podcast if I wrote fecal transplants before. Huh, fecal transplant. Oh, well, it's because I'm writing transport. Uh, transplant. Hopefully I've been saying that, not transport. And uh, yeah, we've got a few on them. So we've got episode... 1169, 248, 1920, 1367, and 1982. But let's give you your answer, Brianna. So do I believe in fecal, my, fecal microbiota transplantation, also known as fecal transplants? Because what are they transplanting? Oh, they're transplanting the microbiome from another individual. That's because when they take the stool from another individual, it has bacteria. 50% of all stool is bacteria. And they're transplanted to another individual. And has it been shown effective? And the answer is, yes, it has. Yes, it has. And the reason is that hopefully that good bacteria that the other person has takes over your Clostridium difficile, because they can do it for C. diff, or a lot of the overgrown bacteria that may happen with SIBO or other gut issues that absolutely does affect many children uh, on the autism spectrum disorder. Would I start with that? 100% no. Have I ever had to recommend fecal transplantation to anyone? The answer is no. Luckily, most people, like 99 point more, uh, would be able, in my opinion, to not have to do this. So 
Why is this more important? Because you never look at the underlying root cause. This is what conventional medicine does. And unfortunately, again, I know I have a lot of naturopathic doctors listen to this. Naturopath, becoming a naturopathic doctor is, in my opinion, my humble opinion, because it's not the only opinion, is getting to be too much like conventional medicine. It's just, it's too close. Like if you want to practice conventional medicine, again, like then you could become a medical doctor and then you could go for postdoctoral work and all sorts of different natural health realms if you want to. But again, it's just, I don't think you start there. You don't. Like you run a bacteria and parasite stool test. So any child with autism, in my opinion, you're running the well, if it's a child, you don't need to run the hormones test, but you're running the omega-3 inflammation test. You're running the food sensitivity test. You're absolutely running the candida metabolic and vitamins test to look for yeast overgrowth, mitochondrial issues, detox issues, vitamin issues. 100% you're running that. And you are definitely running the bacteria and parasite stool test to look for bacterial overgrowth in the, the stool. And um, you're looking for parasites. Yeah, you're looking for sure. I mean, and H. pylori. So that's what I would do, 100%. That is absolutely what I would do. Oh, and of course, the minerals and metals test to look at heavy metals and, and um, uh, mineral ratios in the body. So that's what I'm doing first. And then if I don't get the results I'm looking for six months or eight months down the road, okay, then we're saying, okay, I'm going to take someone else's bacteria and put it in my child's bacteria. I just don't start there. For sure I don't start there because it's actually DNA. Like I know people don't get into this, but I'm not I'm not ready to do that. I wouldn't be ready to take someone else's bacteria, which literally makes up their gut brain axis as well, and put that into someone because believe it or not, personalities can change. Like things can change and I don't want to get too deep into that today, but you can certainly look it up and, and look at the research on that as well. All right. Hopefully that was helpful today. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in. That is my time, but I'll be back tomorrow answering more of your questions on another Cabral House Call.